chapter as well. So happy to be here. We're gonna get started right now. So really, we just wanted to provide you with a, a quick footing and kind of understanding of insurance, the insurance aspect of cyber risk. Um, given the fact that our CSMP webinars really do blast out to a much more, um, you know, IT friendly crowd. Um, my assumptions are that we can kind of assume that everyone understands cyber risk in, in general, right? The, the risks facing our corporate clients today, hackers, ransomware, all that stuff, malware. I don't need to go into that nitty gritty, but what you may not know is kind of the nuances of the insurance marketplace and how the insurance uh, industry is trying to address these exposures. So we want to kind of provide you with that footing uh, and then move on from there. So one of the, the ways I like to kind of describe um, uh, a, a quick background on, on how the insurance industry got involved in cyber risk, right? So usually, you know, you think of risk out there in the world, you come to the insurance industry and ask them to solve that problem, right? Solve that riddle of how, um, you know, we now have uh, technology exposures based on our, um, you know, capabilities and using technology, whether that be your laptop, your computer systems, your mobile devices and things of that nature. So, uh, but then on top of it, we also marry that with um, risk associated with taking in data, housing data, um, storing it, collecting it, doing something with it, right? So that's kind of my, my visual up top is the computer systems, the risk associated with using computer technology, uh, and then also your risk associated with privacy and data, right? So there's kind of two separate buckets, but they do kind of merge together. And again, this was kind of the, you know, if you think of it of presenting uh, the, the problem to the insurance industry to solve, right? Um, so one interesting way to kind of think about is a little short history um, going through back in the uh, kind of mid to late 90s, um, you know, we had increasing use of technology. I'm, I'm thinking back to college years when I had my first email, right? <laughs> and everyone was kind of uh, moving through that, that, those stages. So the early usage of new technology as it was coming about, what, what kind of problems or risks did that kind of create, right? Um, so the early stages were, you know, first cyber policies were kind of uh, developed. We've got some um, little nuances of tech uh, coverage here and there for, you know, a, a virus transmittal through your computer system, things like that. Um, really what kind of moved the marketplace in a, a particular direction was the passage of notification law, so privacy regulation, right? So as you're now using technology and moving into a space where you're now collecting and storing data, um, the first Privacy Notification Act passed in California in 2003, enacted in 2004. Fast forward years later, we've got you know all 50 states with privacy notification law. You've got multiple other pieces of legislation that are governing um, the responsibility of holding private information, right? So from the insurance standpoint, we have corporate clients that are now coming to us and saying, hey, we failed to protect private information of others. What does that mean for us, right? We're starting to see regulatory claims, regulatory fines and penalties, things of that, na that nature. So that is definitely a stepping stone, uh, kind of a milestone to the earmark on the timeline of kind of the, the development of cyber coverage. Um, Round 2005 uh, is definitely what I would call a phase of a uh, mega breach uh, scenario. So we're starting to see, and actually two of my favorite um, mega breach headlines were definitely the TJ Maxx breach that happened in about 2007. Um, if you haven't read about that, definitely read about that. The, uh, the culprit in that situation was highlighted on American Greed, I think, the, the show American Greed. Um, it's a pretty fascinating story, but um, has to do with a lot of grabbing the, the um, personal credit card information, um, going after data that's actually, um, for, you know, valuable to sell on the black market, that type of thing. So those big headline making breaches were now causing the, I'd say the insurance industry to start waking up to this bigger, bigger problem, right? Each one of the kind of mega breach um, claims that you can kind of read about down here um, really add different elements to what the actual cyber exposure was all about. So you could say TJ Maxx was kind of that credit card swipe, pre chip and pin, that type of thing. Um, Sony had a lot to do with some hacktivism. Um, Sony, the Sony case had a lot to do with, um, I think it was George Hotz was trying to jailbreak into the Sony PlayStation. Um, Sony told him to stop, stop doing that. And then uh, they were breached um, on basically on his behalf. So the pretty interesting details there. So we're starting to understand motives behind hacking, um, types of methodologies used to um, penetrate systems, what they're going after, information you know for sale on the black market, yada yada. 
Um, and then the grand finale for us that really kind of moved the needle on the market was definitely the target breach in 2003. Um, so really big, big headlining, headline making claims, right? Um, now move the needle a little bit further into about 2011 um, is when we're starting to see crypto claims and crypto locker claims, ransomware. Um, I think this is a significant shift in understanding um, you know, the mentality of the criminal mind is starting to shift a little bit where it's not about what our customers or the corporate clients have like a TJ Maxx that they could steal and sell in the black market for financial gain, but more about what's important to any sort of company, big or small, that's important to them that they can now corrupt, encrypt, and hold uh, for ransom or extortion, right? So that's where we're seeing that different trend of uh, the criminal activity. Um, Sean, do you have anything to say about this slide, kind of like your own uh, milestones from your career? I think from an insurance standpoint, I know a lot of insurance companies got really comfortable around the concept of just data breach. And the what drove that, I think, is that data breach is kind of quantifiable, right? If you have uh, personally identifiable information that's stored in a, data in a database or in the cloud, or if you, if you transact credit card information, you're capturing that information. When these breaches occur, there was viable data around the cost of these breaches. Um, and there's various studies out um, that describe what the cost of, the, of these kind of various pieces of information are. And so the insurance community got really comfortable around insuring this risk early on. And so that's historically how people have thought about cyber insurance. Um, what we'll learn is how much it's evolved since then beyond simply uh, these simple data breach related items to uh, business interruption and bodily injury, property damage, a whole, a whole bunch of, uh, a whole variety of additional items. But this root in data breach related coverage, I think is interesting to understand. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so the next, so now we've got kind of a, a basis understanding of what the insurance community is starting to address and then um, where it's, it's being taken and moved to because of the nature of the breaches and the, the cyber events that they're starting to see. And again, to comment on Sean's point, I mean, the, the real genesis of the early development of insurance products was really around that data breach, but it definitely has moved into other types of losses that were being suffered by our corporate clients, right? Um, and as these claims started to play out, um, the policy started to get um, tweaked and, and started to involve, evolve in a much more streamlined manner to help um, with these incidences as they came about, right? And so a great way to think about the insurance contract these days is kind of in four different buckets. The first one is probably the first dollar out the door that's going to happen. It's really your incident response, your breach response costs, right? And when we talk about breach response from an insurance standpoint, and these are, these are all covered items in general um, of what the insurance community is gonna do. Um, breach response is really paying for, first your initial call into your breach response team. And who's that team? It's really the legal standpoint. You've got a breach attorney um, that you can get on the phone with and start um, kind of hashing out what the event is. It's a lost laptop. Is it encrypted? Is it not? You've actually got a piece of malware in your system. You've got ransomware demands. What is the actual situation, right? A breach attorney in general um, will then act on your behalf as kind of the quarterback and like lead into the forensics, um, assigning different vendors and teams and things like that to address um, what actually needs to happen from a forensic standpoint. You do have expenses starting to, to rack up here um, and figuring out what is actually happening and what you need to do about it, right? Um, if you do have some sort of data breach, you are going to be um, under uh, now a regulatory microscope a little bit. So you need to like think about notification costs and, and each state by state um, piece of legislation and what needs to happen from there. Public relations might need to happen. Um, customer remediation from a standpoint of, you know, um, uh, offering uh, call service centers and credit card monitoring and things like that. So that's kind of their first bucket of coverage that the insurance community has put together, like breach response, to get um, incident response very quickly um, and get these remediated. Uh, a second bucket to think about is business interruption loss, business income loss. So a company has some sort of uh, cyber breach, cyber claim incident. Um, let's say in a ransomware scenario, they've been encrypted um, and they're shut down for a week or two. 
Um, there is going to be a business interruption cost. Um, that's a calculation of their net loss, things like that. The policy has now evolved into uh, a space where we're not going to be picking up not just the company's computer systems, but also any sort of dependent systems that the company is relying on. So that's a huge feature that has definitely evolved um, over the past couple of years. Um, also including systems failure. So we're not going to be um, talking just about uh, a cyber, a malicious cyber attack, but any sort of systems failure that has led to any sort of business interruption, right? Um, any data restoration that needs to happen, things like that. Um, computer replacement, reputational harm is another interesting one um, where we're, we're, you know, as an insurance industry trying to, trying to tackle that. Uh, another piece of the puzzle that I just want to quickly talk about is the cyber crimes. Now, when you talk about cyber policies in general, um, it's a great way to think about data, uh, intangible information on the cyber side, and actual tangible money, property, and securities on the crime side, right? A lot of times we like to merge these coverages together in the insurance industry because if a hacker is getting into the system and has access to everything under the sun, it's, it may not just be contained under the data, right? Data intangible. They may be able to move money. Um, may be able to manipulate, you know, uh, payroll, uh, set up ghost vendors, things like that from a computer fraud standpoint. One of the biggest um, claims areas that we're seeing these days is fraudulent wire transfer requests coming into our customers. And um, I think Sean can definitely speak to this on a daily basis. You've probably seen a lot of that stuff. Um, social engineering fraud is what the insurance industry is calling this. Um, these are those fake uh, emails coming in purporting to be customers that have changed their bank accounts and asking our clients, our big corporate clients, to move money around. Um, it, Sean, do you want to comment on social engineering? I think you're on mute. No Sorry about that. Um, this is an interesting topic simply because I think um, you as cybersecurity professionals and generally companies in the market, they could do everything right here. They could have everything set in order, but frankly, um, that your clients could get social engineered, a vendor could get social engineered. And when the invoice comes to you um, or someone in finance, a controller or a treasurer, they simply see the invoice, they, they recognize that um, the invoice is from the vendor that they expect to pay and they, and they go ahead and issue the ACH transfer or, or wire the money over only to then have the, the vendor call a few days later and say, hey, um, can we get paid? Like, we haven't received our payment yet. And then the finance person says, oh my goodness, I sent it to the wrong place. It's at that, that, that moment when their heart sinks. Um, and obviously in this scenario, what happens is the adversary is in the network watching and they're watching emails. This is effectively a business email compromise type situation where they're watching exactly what the emails look like, what the invoice looks like. They recreate the email um, and send it really in, in a really straightforward fashion. And, and our risk mitigation technique around this, although um, obviously there are technologies that can capture uh, you know, headers and the way in which emails are, are produced, but they are difficult to actually recognize. Um, so we, we advise our clients to simply have finance put a call into the vendor. And although you received an email and the invoice looks perfect, et cetera, this is not necessarily a lookalike domain as an example where the domain and the email has been changed. Um, in this case, if they simply kind of call the vendor and say, hey, I just wanna confirm the, the routing number or the ACH information, that solves majority of these problems. The other instance that I wanna describe is we actually had a client where the CEO did not recognize that he wasn't getting paid for four months. <laughs> and so uh, in this case, um, an individual um, kind of, again, hacked into email systems, sent an email to HR requesting that his bank routing information um, for his paycheck be changed. Um, and that was an instance where they weren't aware as well. And so obviously there's a lot of, due to breaches around uh, various system, there's a lot of, information out on the public web where it's easy to, to social engineer someone. Um, what's nice about this is even though this is not necessarily like strongly, um, I should say correlated to this idea of security failing, um, it is something that the insurance industry picks up. And I would argue it is the most common 
uh, the most frequent cyber insurance claim we see. Yeah, I definitely want to reiterate that. Um, and again, you know, just for reference, these are we're describing things that the insurance policy in general does cover. So you'd have a contract that has limits and sublimits that are addressing all of these items that we're talking about. And um, so, of course, with social engineering fraud and that kind of fraudulent communication to employees, that's not, not something you can necessarily slap a firewall on. And um, so that's kind of outside the scope of that um, cybersecurity, that real tangible cybersecurity, but really is, is within the scope of, you know, security awareness, training, and things like that, that human factor that we're seeing a lot of. Um, it also kind of leads me to that, that whole um, uh, it, point of, you know, we do see quite a bit of claims from, you know, that Ukrainian hacker model style of, you know, malware in the system, that type of thing. But if there's anything I want you to leave with is also we've got a human factor involved here where the policies that are designed today are really going to be addressing um, rogue employee type stuff um, and also that human error type thing. So human error being, hey, I clicked through, uh, I sent wire transfer money, you know, that type of thing. Or um, we've seen actual physical tangible breaches as well where, um, you know, the mailers on the, the window on an envelope is too big and it's actually showing social security numbers and stuff like that. So we're talking about like digital and non-digital um, type of breaches as well. So pretty all over the board, but yeah, definitely social engineering is one that is um, a hot topic these days. The last bucket that I'm going to talk about just from a kind of overall coverage standpoint um, that's being addressed with the insurance industry is that legal liability standpoint. Um, this one is kind of where I call the other shoe. If this other shoe drops, it drops pretty heavy. It means that all of the breach response um, was probably either uh, the allegation is that you, the company didn't respond in a timely manner or was mishandled, that type of thing. So you've got a lot of liability associated with the failure in your network security caused some economic damage to a third party. They're now bringing a lawsuit. So the policy is designed to pick up your defense costs and your damages on that regard. Same thing with a privacy breach. Your failure to protect private information of others, whether that be your own for, um, own employee base or your customers, um, you now might have a you know uh, a legal liability situation on your hands. Um, we also have some extensions for media liability, where you know you've got some reg, um, some liability associated with what you put out as content, right? Um, so any sort of emotional distress, mental anguish from a breach that's now you know affecting your media, that type of thing. So that's the courtroom setting again. Um, we do see some positive results um, from really great breach response, incident response, speedy and accurate, leading to less and less legal liability situations where we can kind of remediate up front and make sure you don't have the legal li liability on the back end. But when it does happen, and it, and it does, um, it tends to be quite expensive. Um, and we've got a question uh, based on some of the comments we were making, I believe, about, well, social engineering and probably just this slide in general. but. Do cloud services align well with the businesses concerning this? Does it get compl complicated? So I guess kind of like, how does the insurance carrier uh, work with cloud vendors from the customer side and maybe even kind of the breach response side as well? Sure. So um, let me let me break up this concept of cloud services. If you if you have additional like if you want to be more specific happy to address that but i'll i'll define cloud services like one i'm going to hire um you know a SaaS provider to provide some uh some value to my business either in finance or hr or crm or whatever that might be at, as a cloud service right i'll define that as one category and another category of cloud service is your infrastructure kind of the uh, Amazon Web Services, Azure, GPC type comment. Um, and so um, the insurance community absolutely contemplates both of these areas, right? And so let me let me talk about the cloud provider like AWS being most prominent, first of all. So Anne mentioned under the business loss scenario, this concept of business interruption, which effectively states that if I host my infrastructure through a cloud provider such as Amazon, and Amazon goes down for a period of time, and that causes me to lose revenue, does the insurance industry really kind of capture that topic, right? Capture that instance? Um, and the short answer is yes. Um, the insurance industry is absolutely cognizant of the relationship between cloud providers such as Amazon and others. 
um, and have mechanisms in order to protect companies or said differently, indemnify companies for net income loss that occurs as a result of Amazon going down. Now, um, this goes, there's some, there, this is somewhat complicated to your question. Amazon could go down as a result of, of a security failure. They could go, they could get hacked. Now, I recognize that is a very difficult thing to occur, right? Most cloud providers have many, many availability zones with built-in redundancy, et cetera. But in the event that happened and you were not redundant, for some reason your information was compromised, and, or excuse me, and for some reason that slowed your ability to receive net income, the insurance industry would protect you. Um, you're familiar with the concept of a deductible. Um, what the insurance industry does is apply a time deductible around this topic. Um, where you have to wait a period of, you know, I think the maximum in the market today would probably be anywhere from eight to 12 hours. And anything beyond that period, the insurance industry would indemnify you for net income loss. And address the concept of systems failure, where it's no one's really getting hacked. There's just an outage for uh, whatever reason. Um, this happened to uh, Amazon, I believe in 2016, early 2016, where the availability zone and and I believe Ashburn, Virginia went out for a period of time. So again, in that scenario, the insurance industry would protect you as well. There are other instances where you have a cloud, a cloud vendor, right? A, or a software provider that is in the cloud that is storing your information, processing your information, or helping you transact business, right? So if I take my HR related information and I hire a third party, a software provider to house that HR information for me, and they have a, a they, they are compromised and, and they lose that information. Um, state mandate kind of uh, like various states, privacy is still regulated by, by, um, by state governments. And what states generally say is the entity that obtains the data is responsible for breach notification. So I work at Coalition. I give my social security number, bank routing information to Coalition. Coalition then elects to put my information into a third party vendor's cloud. And the third party vendor loses my information. Well, from my perspective, I gave the information to Coalition, right? What they did with it afterwards, like, yes, it impacts me, but for purposes of litigation or for purposes of the state regulatory environment, they require the Coalition notify me. Right. For example, in states like California or Massachusetts, they're going to require things like credit monitoring services and things of that nature. And the burden of cost associated with all of that falls on coalition, falls on the entity that took the data in. So in this scenario, coalition has a contract with this soft software provider and that contract may stipulate that they may assume some of the burden. They may reimburse a portion of it. Um, having worked with a lot of technology companies, most technology companies have a limitation of liability associated with the revenue that they earn on your specific account for a period of year. The contract is the first line of defense. Then the insurance can step in and fill in those gaps in terms of assisting in this scenario. So um, yes, there is some complication here, but the short answer to this topic is the insurance industry absolutely um, is conscious and aware and does what they can to ensure against breaches, both due to security failure or systems failure by a cloud provider. Hopefully that helped. Feel free to add any additional questions regarding that topic if necessary, because I recognize, I recognize it's complex. Well, Sean, good job. <laughs> Okay, so that is, this slide is, is kind of that general overview of what the insurance uh, community has put together as the solution, right? The contract features. But again, you know, kind of going back to that time history, I mean, how on earth would you put underwriting strategies around that? So the idea being, how would the insurance industry just jump into the cyber risk space and ensure all those things and not lose their... <laughs> lose their business in the process, right? So really kind of thinking about those early years, again, you know, back in the 90s of like, you know, then we're moving into that 2003 territory of like this new privacy notification law, 
what happens in the insurance industry is kind of with new risk is we dip a toe in the water, try to figure out how to insure this properly and effectively, but also stay profitable so that they can maintain claims, right? So the early years really, um, I was on the brokerage side. I think Sean was as well. It was just very like limited market capacity. There's only a few markets to kind of dip in that toe in. Rigorous underwriting requirements. Um, Sean, I'm sure you remember like the customer would have to come to the table with their own ten to fifteen thousand dollar expensive, you know, cybersecurity assessment, and then present that to the insurance underwriter to say, "Hey, we've done this thing. We've paid for it ourselves." And then they would maybe be presented with a quote, and if they did get a quote, it was very expensive, um, no less than you know ten thousand per million dollars, if not you know triple that cost. So. That's kind of the early years and the coverage was nowhere near the slide before. It was pretty limited in scope, definitely didn't get into the systems failure, independent systems and things like that. So moving into kind of the bigger breach, the data breach type thing, that's been, you know, Sean had mentioned this before, the insurance community definitely got com more comfortable with the risk, um, having seen the evolution of some of the claims kind of jump in. Um, so we saw a significant increase in market capacity. What that does for any topic in insurance is creates lower premiums because now there's competition. It creates kind of an expansion of terms so people are starting to differentiate their product from carrier to carrier. And so we're starting to see a little bit of the expansion relative to the claims that are actually coming in, right? Um, and so that was kind of the, the hotbed there. And then, but really what we're seeing today, and if I really want to kind of like, uh, like really push this point is that we're we are seeing this evolution now to definitely incorporate more technology into the underwriting um, uh, methodology um, and also provide cyber services to insureds along with that insurance contract to reduce those claims going forward so really we're on top of the past couple of years of that what we're calling kind of the future of cyber risk which is re really what coalition is all about it's that transition away from traditional underwriting where that used to be an application to say, hey, do you have firewall and antivirus? Check, check, right? Here's your quote. Um, Sean, I, I'd love for you to kind of give that hospital um, example that you do across the street, right? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I sure have to It's such a technology and insurance um, and using that technology in the underwriting process as well as reducing claims. So, Sean, what do you have to say about that? Oh, I was going to, I was just going to address that hospital thing you were referencing. Yeah, yeah. Kind of the, the concept there is um, historic, like if you think about cyber insurance, right? Cyber insurance, what historically would happen is, and, and even uh, today, many insurance companies will send you, let's call an eight to 25 page application, right? And it'll take some standard, it, it'll request standard um, information such as uh, what's the name of your company? What's your website? What's your address? How much revenue do you have? Do you collect kind of PII or PHI? They might ask you what firewall you have. What are your cloud providers? Um, and it, it's pretty robust and asks a lot of questions. The reality is, however, oftentimes what the insurance company is going to do is, is rate your insurance specifically on the size of company you are, the industry you're in, and perhaps the amount of records you hold, right? So if you're a, I'm just gonna make this up, if you're a $50 million hospital on one side of the street and you have 500,000 records of PHI, of health-related information, and across the street, you're another hospital with the same amount of revenue and the same amount of record count, the insurance industry is gonna rate both of these companies identically. Now, invariably, one of these hospitals says, you know what, this whole cybersecurity thing is really concerning to me. And you guys know how important uh, HIPAA-related items are for hospitals and in the spirit of cybersecurity. So one says, hey, I'm going to invest. Um, a 50, I'm a $50 million company. I'm going to invest $2.5 million in cybersecurity. And they go to their broker and the insurance community and they say, hey, I'm going to get some bang for my buck, right? I'm going to get premium reduction and superior coverage around, around as a result of my investment. Today, many insurance companies, they don't have the technical acumen to actually assess whether or not that cybersecurity investment actually reduced the risk of a claim. So unfortunately, more often than not, these two insurance companies or these two hospitals would continue 
to be treated the same and priced the same. We do things a bit differently and there are other companies that do things differently and we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, yeah, I, thanks, John. I really like that example because that's kind of the, what I would say the traditional or maybe, um, uh, well, we'll just leave it there. The traditional way of underwriting cyber risk has been to just kind of grab that application as much information you as you can on paper and then uh, assess via a, a handful of criteria, which would be industry class and you know amount of records and revenue size and things like that. The evolution that we're talking about now is how do you use and incorporate um, uh, artificial intelligence technology into that underwriting process to make a more defined um, selection, risk selection, and on top of it, then use technology to reduce risk. And so that's really, um, that's where I leave off here and I'm gonna lead into uh, an introduction to Coalition and Sean's company. And Sean, I'm gonna stop my screen share here and you can take it from, well, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna run these slides and we'll do the, the screen share. So Sean, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, I mentioned this problem associated with, um, with underwriting, right? It's just hard. And, and the reality is the difficulty of underwriting emanates from a lack of technical acumen associated with cybersecurity in the insurance community. Um, Coalition, our, our company was founded by one of the individuals who uh, he was the CXO at Cloudflare. Um, a very early employee there. And the other one was the CEO, CEO and founder of Lookout, um, a mobile security platform. Um, our company is built very differently than an insurance company in that 65% of our staff are engineers. Um, and individuals who spent, frankly, many of them come from the government and played offense for the US government in cyber warfare. So we built our company really on the basis that we believe there is an elegant solution with insurance and cybersecurity working together hand in hand. To describe this differently, um, there are many cybersecurity firms that when um, a breach happens or they're in, they are asked to protect companies, and when a breach occurs, they stand behind a limitation liability. And they don't really have the incentive alignment of cybersecurity companies sometimes is difficult, right? Um, because um, you can pay a lot of money to assist in cybersecurity, um, but you don't always get the result you want. And when things go south, there isn't always a way in which the company can actually help you. Don't get me wrong. Coalition is a strong believer in cybersecurity, and, and I'll talk more about that. In contrast, the insurance community provides tremendous value when a claim occurs, right? So your company has a data breach, um, and then... It, the, in the cyber insurance community, there's a high probability that they will cover the claim in its entirety. There really isn't a problem around claims getting paid in cyber insurance. However, beyond that, beyond simply paying the claim, the insurance community is also going to help you with forensics. They have vendors that go out, vendor, you know, insurance companies that write cyber insurance have a vendor panel of the notable type companies like Mandiant or Kivu or Kroll who come in and can actually rectify a situation, do all the forensic work, understand the root cause of, of the incident that happened, get the adversary out and remediate the situation that occurred. Many companies don't have relationships with forensic firms. And so when a breach occurs, perhaps internal IT doesn't have the capability in order to kind of get the adversary out and solve the instance. And so having the resources of forensic firm can be really useful. Well, what if, what if it's actually a data breach and now you have to notify customers? So you have to notify 100,000 customers. Well, how do you do that? Well, again, the insurance company is going to step in. They'll have their attorneys lined up. They'll know exactly what to do. They'll have the notification systems all lined up. And it works like clockwork, right? It's actually really straightforward. And that's really helpful. All of this is done under counsel. Like, so it's not discoverable. It's done through a breach coach, which is a, a law firm. However, then the adversary is supposedly out and then a claim happens the next week, right? Because the, comp the insurance company didn't necessarily do anything to prevent a new adversary coming in. They just simply solved the problem that occurred there. And this is different, right? This is like having your, um, a building burned to the ground, an insurance company stepping in and actually helping rebuild the building, which is very useful. 
In cyber, though, it's a lot more complicated in terms of preventing an adversary from getting out or preventing an adversary from coming back or in ensuring, ensuring that the adversary is no longer there. Coalition, we felt like there was a better way in which we could, in a cohesive fashion, bring together the world, worlds of cybersecurity and insurance in order to produce a more viable solution for the small to medium enterprise. Um, and uh, perhaps on, on, uh, let's, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then um, this kind of just tells you a little bit, Coalition, we offer insurance $15 million, $15 million in the US of limit. Um, and we write in behalf of some of the largest companies in the world. The next slide is actually the one I'd like to focus on. And I'll give you a sense on how we kind of go about doing this. Um, let me start on the right hand side, if that's all right. Um, and then I'll move to the left. So coalition, we have um, well over 10,000 policyholders. Each of these policyholders, um, we provide competitive pricing. We have our own policy form that has a suite of coverages, which enables us to acquire customers. One of the things that we built in-house at Coalition is something we call a signals intelligence platform. The purpose of this platform is to better underwrite cyber related risks. And what we do is we do a passive, like said differently, an outside in scan of a company in the underwriting process. And many of you are familiar with this. It's like the idea of walking along the outside of a building and seeing how frequently windows are left open or doors are left unlocked. However, never actually walking inside the building. Um, our, our, our goal here actually is to view an account through the lens of an adversary. An adversary is rarely walking into a building and installing a USB drive with malicious content. Generally, they're doing this from their desk and they're scanning the internet looking for vulnerabilities, unpatched software, compromised credentials, lookalike domains. Our technology platform attempts to do the exact same thing across the internet. Thereby, what it enables us to do is take this process that I described, which was, you know, eight to 25 pages of application information, um, you know, a 10 to 15 day process in terms of getting a quote, and we reduce that experience to about two to three minutes, where we ask only four questions, we simplify that process. Um, we are not only attempting to underwrite companies that come through our portal, right, so when a broker puts an account through our portal, that's not really our goal. We're literally attempting to underwrite the internet. We're attempting to understand kind of what are the, the, the habits, what are the tactics of adversaries? How are our policyholders and other policyholders, how are they doing as respects to, soft, or to, updated, to updating their software, kind of the credentials that are out there in the public domain? Um, all of this data enables us to do some pretty interesting things on the left-hand side of this page. So one of the things we do as an insurance company is we install sprinkler heads, right? In cybersecurity language, we have built a variety of security tools, which we offer at no cost to all of our policyholders. We offer a DDoS mitigation tool. Um, at no cost. We offer, um, in fact, it's, cl uh, it's Cloudflare. We offer um, uh, a patch manager. We offer a lookalike domain tool. Um, and within hours of being aware, uh, and a variety of other things, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of balancing this with time, but within hours of becoming aware of a particular threat occurring that we can see publicly visible on the internet, we'll notify the policyholder and give them instructions on how they can kind of fix this problem, right? It's kind of the notification where an insurance company says, hey, your, your building's about to catch on fire. There's something burning really hot. Or a different example in San Francisco, there are auto insurance companies that will flag you and tell you that you're parking in a zone that's about to be uh, street cleaned and you're gonna receive a ticket as a result, right? We're providing these added services. Obviously that information that we have also enables us to underwrite in my prior example, the two hospitals very differently because we would recognize that one had improved their security tremendously and then we can price their, their account very differently than others. 
The final thing that I'll mention is because Coalition has our own incident response team, our ability to not only bring data to a claim, um, uh, that enables us to act really fast in a claim scenario, but also enables us to collect additional data, thereby enabling us to lower losses, and then that feedback loop continues, right? Um, and that's kind of the spirit of this slide. Um, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? Um, on the next slide, we kind of just highlight that what we're trying to do is operate very differently from a uh, from your standard insurance company, right? So we bring security expertise to the table. Um, we do everything we can to scan and understand uh, what's happening around the internet and analyze that information. Um, the point here is that our underwriting model is our technology tool. They're not, they're one and the same. It's not like we're taking a scan from a third party and just inputting it as one factor in our rating model. If you're a manufacturing entity and you're running a SCADA system that's publicly visible on the internet, we think that's a problem. And we're not gonna permit you to have bodily injury or property damage related coverage as a result of a cyber incident. Um, we're not gonna enable you to have that coverage. So, so to say this a little bit differently, the risk is correlated to the premium, which you would assume would happen all the time um, it just historically has not happened very often in cyber, okay? Um, let's go to the next slide. And, and before I kind of dive into a bit of a demo, what I'd like to do is just take some of the questions that I see that are being flagged, right? So um, there's um, a few questions that I see. So um, one is, do you plan to do a security audit like health screening before contract? We have many of our clients that um, are actively monitoring the security of their vendors. Again, not in a penetration testing type scenario, but really in a situation where they're reviewing if their vendors are being exposed to vulnerabilities or other related threats and monitoring that for their own benefit. So um, yeah, I think, I think it is more and more common where companies are aware that the cyber, their cyber related risks go beyond simply their own entity. And it also kind of goes downstream, whether it be or upstream in a supply chain scenario, or certainly with vendors that they're utilizing, right? Um, the next question that I see is, do you perform random anonymous scans to target business? Um, we do not. We, we don't use the scan for any other purpose than underwriting, um, than assessing risk. Um, so it's not really intended as a new business tool. That's not really its purpose. Um, we work exclusively through distribution partners, um, such as Ann, like um, in, insurance related brokers. Um, and so we do um, expose the results of our scan to the actual policy holder. And, and we attempt to help them throughout the policy period actually improve their cyber related risks. Another question, curious, do your policies cover attacks by all criminal groups, including nation state actors? Or is there a differentiation in payouts um, based on who the attack is attributed to, if it's even known? That's a really good question. And I think you identified the, the concern here, right? Is it's, it's relatively rare. Attribution is not always easy to do. It's not something that everyone is willing to do simply because of the cost and effort associated with it. So there's obviously many adversarial attacks that occur without any attribution. And so uh, it's really difficult for the policy, the insurance company to be aware of situations where it is a nation state actor versus someone else. I think the issue that you might be getting to is that there are some insurance companies that, um, that uh, limit uh, the ability for the policy to cover a situation where something is treated as an act of war, right? Um, and so when something is, when we're in war times, and this is true for virtually all insurance companies, um, where insurance, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a war going on and a building gets burned to, to the ground, most insurance companies are going to be reluctant to pay that claim. Um, it's very similar in cyber. So there are some issues with this concept of war, but otherwise, yes, I would expect an insurance policy to cover the things you mentioned. I believe I've captured these questions. Um, and does that, does the queue look cleared from your standpoint? 
I actually think we had one more question. I missed a few slides back regarding, uh, it was coming hot off the heels of the hospital uh, example. Are HIPAA and, and healthcare related um, incidences more, um, more challenging to, uh, to remediate than others? Yeah, I actually responded to that in the chat, but I'll, oh, go ahead, okay. I, I'll go ahead and highlight it. I don't, I mean, the risks associated with HIPAA violations, you have to deal with other things like OSHA and, 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 and there is some complexity there, but I wouldn't actually comment that it's more challenging than, than, than other industries, right? Frankly, in the, like cybersecurity is agnostic to industry. Ad the adversarial community is agnostic to, to industry. They'll hack anyone. We believe in this concept of how adversaries work around this idea that there are targets of choice and there are targets of opportunity. A target of choice is a company, um, a very prominent company like JP Morgan, or Amazon, or um, you know, uh, perhaps um, like a presidential campaign, as an example. And our belief is um, adversaries with enough resources and enough time, they will always get into a network. Um, we actually don't put time. We don't ensure targets of choice uh, commonly, right? A target of opportunity is the vast majority of U.S. businesses. Um, like 99% of them. And, and the spirit there is that what an adversary is doing is scanning the internet, for example, for remote desktop, right? That's Microsoft remote desktop that's publicly visible on the internet. And then, and then independent of who the company is, whether it's a healthcare company or retailer or a hotel chain, they're going to target remote desktop and they're gonna stuff credentials into that kind of email and password until they get it right and then enter the, the network as an authenticated user. Um, this concept of targets of opportunity is really what we're looking for, right? And so whether it's a hospital chain or something else, um, I don't think it's any more challenging. It, we do find, however, that hospital healthcare related claims are more severe in that the costs of the claims are higher, all right? Um, oh. Uh, another All question. Right, Sean, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop share here, and then we're going to quickly run the demo because we've got just a few minutes left. Um, maybe right. do like a 10 minute run on that demo, and then any other questions we can kind of clean up at the end. I can do that. Okay, um, cool. So let me share my screen. All right, and will you just confirm you can see my screen? I can. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a coalition company called Binary Edge. Some of you may actually be familiar with Binary Edge in that it is a prominent tool used by security researchers all over the world. Um, uh, Binary Edge attempts to scan uh, every IPv4 address, about 250 million IPv6 addresses, hundreds of times a month and in an attempt for data collection and really an attempt to understand what's happening around the internet. And so if I kind of just go in and type in a large company um, uh, like Deloitte, um, you can see that, um, oops, if I could type it in, right? Apologize. Um, you can see that if I type in kind of Deloitte, we capture a variety of information associated with this account, right? Like they're, they're running 82 instances of RDP, um, there are various words that we see kind of publicly visible on the internet, IP addresses on where the, on, uh, excuse me, countries on where the IP addresses emanate. And then these are like publicly visible kind of instances of remote desktop, just simply because that's one thing that we're looking at around the internet, right? Um, the same thing could happen around uh, data leaks. So for example, if I just use the, the example, the same example and continue, uh, again, just to, I, I could do this with anyone, but just kind of a random company. Uh, this, for those of you that are familiar with Have I Been Pwned, this is not Have I Been Pwned data. This is data that we're collecting on our own, but it's similar in nature, right? Where um, we're able to see kind of the leaks that have occurred with that domain around the internet um, and, and to go in for a long time, right? So this particular pace bin domain, it had 4,771 leaks associated with the Deloitte.com kind of domain. 
If I look at the detail, we actually show the, in, the, the email addresses that were compromised. Again, all of this is public information um, that we've simply captured from the internet, right? Um, now, what I'm showing you is something that we actually provide all of our policyholders at no cost, right? So to provide you kind of, um, and mention this evolution of cyber, to provide you some scope of what's occurring here is we're attempting to do everything we can to mitigate and alleviate cyber related risks from our policyholders by providing them a tool like this. One final thing that I'll just show in, in the spirit of time, I'll kind of leave it at this. We put out a few hundred kind of virtual machines across the internet with the sole purpose of understanding what companies are scanning for, or excuse me, adversaries are scanning for. What are adversaries looking for? What are they attempting to target? Again, this is the idea that if someone's robbing a house on one side of the neighborhood, we wanna be able to understand what the, what the adversarial tactics are, such that we can help the community on the other side of the neighborhood that might not be aware of, about what this robber is doing. So here, this is just over the period of the past seven days. Um, I made this a little bit too big, I think. The Russian Federation, IP addresses emanating from the Russian Federation have scanned our virtual machines over 279 million times just in the past seven days. You can see the ASNs that are utilized, the IP addresses that we're most commonly seeing. Just to be clear, the United States is doing this as well. This is actually what's more interesting. So here you can see the various ports that are being scanned. We, we left all, all, the six, all ports open on these machines. And then actually as we correlate or tag these ports that are being scanned, you can see the number one item that is being scanned by adversaries as respects to our network, they're scanning for RDP. Um, and not surprisingly, we believe RDP is a significant contributor to ransomware. And so in this case, just over the past seven days, they've scanned our, our machines 220 million times for RDP, right? We do capture the payloads they're deploying as well. There's a whole lot more I can share, um, but I'm going to stop here for the moment, just in the last few minutes we have, answer any additional questions and help where we can. Um, I saw a question about, do you operate through external legal firms or do you have in-house lawyers globally? Um, it, it's, it's actually important that you operate through a third party legal firm. So the breach coach, when you hire a forensic firm in the middle of a breach or things of that nature, um, companies don't want that information to be discoverable. So you hire legal firms, um, external firms, they, they are not, our, our lawyers are, um, are individuals that work for other firms and you contract individuals that deal with hundreds, if not thousands of breaches a year to kind of manage and, and contract out all of the services that happen in a breach. Um, so those are not in-house attorneys. Good question. And I think that's it. Cool, nailed it, 5.59. Um, any other questions for us? We, I know that this is a lot to digest. There's a lot to this um, product and, and all the insure techs and all the new um, technology that we're using in the insurance industry. So feel free to reach out to the CSMP to get a hold of us. Um, I do want to mention another um, kind of insurancy related topic, but um, maybe actually outside of insurance, but more uh, on the legal side, because we just got that legal question. We are going to be putting together a CSMP webinar to um, discuss specifically the legal and regulatory environment around cybersecurity. So we will have a panelist of attorneys and breach coaches, uh, and we'll have that for you in a couple months too. So that's a really helpful aspect of um, the insurance community is just one of the pillars that are trying to attack, you know, the, um, the cyber, cyber risk in general and kind of solve that problem for our customers. And so uh, we'll, we'll just kind of keep, uh, keep you involved. Thanks so much, Sean, that was great. Great Happy demo. Um, and we will follow up with any other questions that are coming in right now. And thanks for your time. All right, thanks everyone.